God is good. I'm excited about this series that he's calling us to do today, and he can't stop us from moving forward. Uh, So would you just pray with me as we jump into this new series today? Jesus, thank you, God. Thank you that you are on the throne, that through every trial, every uh, challenge, God, we we can just know and rest in, in security, knowing that you have it under control, God, and I just pray you'd move today now as we open up our, uh, the Word of God, Lord Jesus, and, and to encounter you through your Word, and so I just pray that we would just see you bigger than we ever have before, and we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. I also meant to mention, today's actually kind of a special day for me. Um, Last year, it was actually tomorrow officially, but last year we came in and preached a message and you guys were crazy enough to vote us in as your pastors. (laughs) That was a year ago. Um, I hope you don't have any regrets, but we're really happy to be your pastors and just be here. We're we're excited about what God's been doing and and just thankful to be able to serve here. Um, I've been, you know, as as I went away for vacation, I was praying before, God, what do you want me to talk about when I come back? And I honestly was just going to do a series in the Psalms, which would have been great, but all of a sudden, God just changed direction, and he really poured on my heart this, uh, this series that we're going to be talking about, and I just know very strongly, like, this is perfect for what we're going through right now. And the series I'm calling it is called Stirring Our Faith. Um, and the word stirring means to cause great excitement. <laughs> and how many of you know, like, sometimes we just need that great, we're not always excited about our faith, and we need that stirred up in the life of faith we have. You see, faith is a cornerstone to our walk with God. And it's so critical that teach, uh, Scripture teaches us this in Hebrews eleven six. Now, without faith, it's impossible to please God. That's how critical faith is. And, and for most of us in this room, we stepped across the line of faith when we trusted God to save us from our sins and restore us into a right relationship with God. But, but here's what I found. From there, so many Christians... They limit the amount of faith they are living by day by day in living out their walk with God. Just think about this for a moment. How excited are you about your relationship with God right now? Just want you to think about it. (laughs) Hopefully some of you, but I, I mean, I bet you some of us aren't. I mean, we're in the middle of summer, right? And for many of us, we're more excited that this week there's fireworks, and we get to go to, the, to see the fireworks or the cookout or the pool party that we're going to be at this week or the other distractions like baseball and all of these other great things than we are with God, which is actually why we need a little stirring of our faith. We need to stir up a little excitement about the one thing that should matter the most, and that is, is that we have been given an awesome relationship. We've been restored back right with our creator, the lover of our souls, that's who we get to serve. I titled, to this, I titled today's message, Your God is Too Small. And honestly, a, a few months, probably about six months ago, there was a book I just saw the title and it said, Your God is Too Small. And I'm like, hmm. And it just stuck with me. And sometimes those things happen where just, just a concept just stuck with you. And I kept thinking about this over the last six months. Your God is too small. Your God is too small. And honestly, I just want to invite you to kind of do what I've been doing for six months, and that is I want you just to, to think about in what ways right now do you feel like you're keeping God packed nice and neat in your life? Like night, he's, he just fits, and he's right there, and he doesn't mess anything up, and he stays in your nice little box, and he's cool as long as he stays there. You know, how about that? You know, and as I evaluate my life, here's what I see. I see every day I find ways to limit God. I mean, if I'm really honest, I, I, I'm not like always living on top of faith. I find ways to limit God and make him smaller than he really is. And at the root of that is honestly something that you don't want to always acknowledge. But, you know, as I've prayed and saw it, I mean, I know the root of it is I kind of want to control God. As long as God is small, I can tell him what to do and, and put him where I want him to be and not let him get into the areas that I don't want him to be. And honestly, there's a sense of fear sometimes of being overwhelmed by God. 
And yet, here's the deal. At certain moments, when I'm in prayer, when I'm really laid out before God, seeking God, I understand that the greatest thing I need is actually to be overwhelmed by God. I need that. I actually want that. And yet, I live my life trying to control God and keep him small so that he doesn't overwhelm me. As we begin today, can I just ask you to admit with me that how you see God right now today is too small? It's not big enough? Every day this week I've been praying for God to bust through the small boxes I've kept God in. I've been praying to see God as he really is, not defined by what I think God is. And this is my prayer for our church, that as we go through this series, God would stir our faith to see him bigger than we've ever seen him before in our lives, that we live by faith, not by sight. And so I'm just praying that God moves in power today as as we do that. If you've read your Bible, and I'm I'm guessing that most of you have, (laughs) so if you've read your Bible, I think it's easy to see the power of belief or the power of faith at work in the lives of people in scripture that you're, that you're reading about. Uh, what we see in every story of someone who is following their call, walking in obedience to God in the direction that God has called them to is that God leads them into situations in their life where they face the impossible and he comes through and does the impossible. For example, think about this. It was David's faith that allowed him to, it was David's faith in God, let me make that clear, not just his faith, it's David's faith in God that allowed him to kill Goliath. It was faith in God that Daniel's sitting in the lion's dead, sleeping with the lions, and he doesn't get harmed at all, he survives that. It was by faith that three young Hebrew children are thrown into a fiery furnace and come out and they can't even smell smoke on them. It's by faith that Abraham, God tells him, hey, get up and leave your family, and I am going to make you into a nation, and he obeys and does it. It is by faith that God led Israel on a march around Jericho, and guess what happened? The walls fell down, and they conquered that. When we move into the New Testament, we see the faith of Jesus caused the lame to walk. It caused the blind to see. It caused the leper to be healed, and it caused many other affirmities to be healed. We see demons cast out. We see the dead come back to life. Peter believes Jesus that he has power to let him walk on the water just to come to him out there. The Philippian jailer believes that if he calls on the name of the Lord, he is going to be saved and so is his household. And Jesus tells us this in Matthew 17, 20, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will tell this mountain, move from here to there and it will Move, And what we see is over and over and over stories of people believing God and what he says is true and seeing incredible, incredible miracles take place around them because they believe God. And those stories, what are they meant to do? They're meant to build up our faith so that when we're in need of miracle working power of God, we can believe that God can do it. Can I tell you, the supernatural work of God is all over the scriptures. It's everywhere from the beginning to the end. You see God showing up in people's lives and doing the impossible, stirring up our faith so that we can believe God. On the other side of this, though, scripture does deal with the power of unbelief. I mean, think about this. Eve was tempted to doubt the goodness of God And she chose unbelief instead. And we're living in that mess ever since today, right? The people in Noah's days refused to lead or to believe the warnings that Noah was giving, and it didn't turn out so well for them either. I mean, Aaron and the Israelites doubted God right after God pulled them out of Egypt, delivered them from the iron fist and hand of Egyptians, and they're building a golden calf. And guess what? 3,000 people die because they didn't believe God and live for him. It's unbelief that keeps people from trusting in God that he is able to save our souls. And instead, it leads them to hell because they reject God. And they live in eternity separated from God. And so we see also throughout the stories of the Bible people who refuse to believe and how that impacts their life. They don't see the miracles of God. They don't see God at work. Life doesn't go so well when you reject God. What I want you to understand is unbelief and belief are both choices you and I make. 
See, what, we're, we're done, what happens is we're presented with some reality of what happened, and we either choose to believe it or not. Remember the old show, Ripley's Believe It or Not? They show you some of the craziest, weirdest stories, and at the end they go, believe it or not. Well, we have these stories of the Bible, and at the end there is this call to believe it or not. But the choice that we make has incredible consequences. The Bible makes it clear that living by faith or this living our lives trusting and obeying God no matter what, no matter what the circumstances we find ourselves in, no matter what everything around us is saying, but refusing to look at that but to trust and believe God, that leads us to blessing. A refusal to trust that, though, leads us outside of that blessing. Now, let me be clear about something. God's blessings... It does not mean no suffering or hardships. I think we need to make that very clear because, first of all, some of you are here today in the middle of a situation right now, and it does not feel like a blessing at all of what you're in. There's real pain and there's real suffering going on. But it is faith in God that will get you through. And that's why these stories of faith in the Bible are there there to get us to understand that we can trust God. And, and I think some of the problem is, is that we get too familiar with the stories and how God came through that we miss that there's almost always a struggle that, t- that it took to get them there, to the other side of it. Let me show you a story that I pray will breathe some life into the struggle you might be facing today and cause a stirring of your faith to believe that God's going to get you through whatever you're facing today. John chapter 11, we find the story of Lazarus. And most of you know the story. The friend of Jesus is Lazarus, and he is sick. And his sisters send word to Jesus to come. And what do we find? Jesus waits three more days, right, before he comes, and Lazarus has died. And both Mary and Martha greet Jesus with the same greeting. John 11, 32 is one of theirs. But it says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Ever feel that way? You're praying, you're asking God to come through, and all you're getting is delays. And things are getting worse. And what's our temptation? It's to think God doesn't really care, right? About what I'm going through. Or maybe maybe God can't fix my problem. Or maybe... Maybe it's, if you had been there, if you'd just been here, all this stuff would have been fixed and the bad wouldn't have happened. But can I just tell you this as lovingly as I can? Maybe the issue is that our view of God is too small. Maybe we can't see that God is actually up to something bigger than we could ever imagine. But to get there is really hard. Lazarus died. Things got as bad as they ever could because when something dies, it's over, right? That's the end. That's just cut off. And here is what's very challenging for all of us. God knows what's in our life that needs to die. But we fight death every step of the way because we have no understanding what's on the other side. We don't know what's there. And so it's easier to hold on to what we know, even if it's bad, than to let go and let it die, knowing that on the other side is something better. And so what do we do? We pray, God, keep these areas alive in my life. Do this, do that. And and we pray, and when God doesn't come through and that area dies, it hurts. We grieve because we know that when something dies, it's over but not with Jesus. Listen closely. Many of us know the story so well that we rejoice because we know what's coming. Lazarus gets raised from the dead. It's an incredible miracle worth rejoicing over. But think about this. We, we know God is good. We see God is good. But Mary and Martha weren't feeling like this when Jesus was late and he finally shows up. Where were you? You weren't here. And if you had been, this bad wouldn't have happened. What did Jesus know? 
Jesus knew Lazarus had to die because there was something bigger he was going to do. And it was going to impact Lazarus' life more than anything else you could imagine. But it was also going to impact everyone around him more than they could ever imagine. As long as that story stays something we read about in their lives and we're okay with them, but we're not okay with it happening to us, listen, we're going to keep struggling with our situation. God knows the areas of our lives that needs to die because something bigger is on the horizon that can't take place until that thing is gone. But it doesn't seem very comforting to read that when I'm in my struggle. We don't want those things to die. But it's only when those things die that Jesus shows up. And when that happens, it not only changes your life, but it actually changes the lives of those around you. You know, I I don't use scripture just to beat us up, but this, sometimes in context of just what's going on in our real lives, these things make a huge impact. Look what Psalm 35, 30 verse 5 says, Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Listen, you may be in a time right now of weeping. God gets it. He showed up at the tomb of Lazarus with Mary and Martha, and what does he do? He weeps. He gets it. But faith knows. Faith knows that in the morning there's going to be great rejoicing that replaces all of this sorrow. And while the weeping is real in the life of Mary and Martha, because they endured a literal loss of their their brother Lazarus is dead. Their joy is eclipsed to a new level when Jesus raises him from the dead. They're no longer weeping anymore, and there is a joy that replaces that like nothing they've ever experienced before in their lives. And so they were able, you're able to hold on to faith and knowing and trusting that Jesus is able to eclipse any sorrow or grief we could ever experience. Here's what I want you to hold on to. A moment with God changes everything. So cling to him and his promises. But here's the problem. You don't know when that moment is going to happen. You don't know the moment of your miracle until the moment your miracle arrives. And until that place, you're in that spot of hope, of faith. And many people forfeit their miracle because they think Jesus is too late. It is over. And so you move on or you cut away from Jesus. But often it is the moment when you think all of this is over is when God is ready to do a miracle. When he is about to arrive. God is never late and he knows what he's doing. And nothing is impossible with him. I know I could end the service right there and you could go home and have a ton to just stir up your faith, but we need some more stirring. And so we got more to cover. And I want to talk about two reasons why unbelief happens. The first is unbelief happens when we get too familiar with God, or at least we, we think we know God. It is why we must always remember that the God we know is too small from the God that is. The main text for today is found in Mark 6. I'm going to read it and then pull a few truths from it. I'm going to read Mark 6, 1 through 6, but I'm going to skip verse 4. You can read it on your own. But he went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished. Where did this man get these things, they said? What is this wisdom given to him, and how are, they, how are these miracles performed by his hands? Isn't this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, Joseph's uh, Judas and Simon, and aren't his sisters here with us? And they were offended by him. And so he was not able to do any miracles there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them, and he was amazed at their unbelief. And I want you to understand that verse 5 and 6 connects their lack of faith with an inability of Jesus to be able to do any miracles there. And I just, somehow, the power of unbelief can keep us from the miracles of God that he wants to do. Do you realize Jesus, he wanted to do miracles there? When Jesus is in the room, he wants to do miracles. And they missed it. Why? Unbelief. 
Now, Jesus didn't somehow lack the power to perform miracles. And what I mean by that is, is I think it's important to make very clear, our belief does not empower Jesus to do a miracle. He doesn't need our belief to do a miracle per se. He, he, we can't add anything to the work, miracle working power of Jesus. Do you get that? I think that's important to understand because a lot of times people are teaching about healing and faith like we're lacking what God needs and so God withholds. And so if you're not healed, you lack faith. It's not true. The issue here was that their unbelief took away from the reason and purpose Jesus had to do a miracle. The reason Jesus did miracles in the first place was they were evidence that pointed to his claims to be God. In Matthew 12, the Pharisees asked Jesus to perform a sign to show him that he was who he really is. And Jesus knows that even if he showed them a sign, they wouldn't get it. And so he says, listen, I'm not going to give you a sign. The only sign you're going to see is the sign of Jonah. And he was professing or prophetically talking about his death when he would go into the tomb for three days and he would rise again. That's the only sign you're going to see because he knew a miracle wouldn't win them over. In Matthew 11, he says that if the places he did the most miracles around Israel happened in Sodom and Gomorrah, they would have repented. But none of those cities were having revival. Why? Because all they cared about was a miracle and they were missing the point of the miracle which pointed to Jesus. And he wasn't interested in giving them a show. He was interested in showing the miracles that pointed to him and authenticated that he was really who he said he was. Miracles are done to confirm that he is who he claims to be. So how does that work in our lives? One of the main reasons we see they didn't believe Jesus was who he claimed to be was because they, they knew him. At least they thought they knew him. Again, look at verse 3. Isn't this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? And aren't these his sisters with us? In truth, Jesus was a carpenter. You know, these were his family. These were the people that surrounded him. All these things were true about Jesus, but guess what? They're not a complete picture of who Jesus was or is. And that's the problem. Sometimes we act as if we know God so much. We get really arrogant. I know God. And I know what he would do and what he wouldn't do. And, he's, and we only have this partial view of God. He is way bigger than what we know. And not recognizing that's a big deal. Because listen, when we limit God to what we are familiar with, we limit God. So we need to grow to see God bigger. That growth, though, needs to be anchored in the Word of God. Scripture teaches us in Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And our faith in what God can do is rooted in hearing and seeing the stories at work in the Bible that teach us what God can do. I want to make that very clear because we live in a spiritual climate today that wants to create God in our own image and likeness to fulfill all of our wants and all of our desires. And that is not a God that exists. That is not what faith is. Faith isn't really trying to get a bigger view of God by creating a God we want. Our expansion of God is not based on our desires, but upon what the scriptures teach us of who God is. And that's why faith, it's not telling God what to do. It's believing, though, that whatever you're going through, God is able to creatively come up with a solution to do the impossible, to accomplish what we need in our lives, however he wants. Often that doesn't happen because of the boxes we keep God in, like God can do this and he can't do that. But it's nothing new in history. That challenge has always been with us. For example, if we read John chapter 9, Jesus, he ends up healing this guy who's blind. He spits on the ground, he makes some mud, and he tells him, go wash this off in the pool of Siloam and you will be healed. And he did it. He was healed. And when someone got healed, after having an affliction, one of the things they had to do was to go show themselves to the religious leaders and they would confirm that indeed they were healed and could be restored back to the community. And so this guy is standing before the Pharisees and he can now see. He had been blind his whole life. His parents confirmed that. The community confirms that. They know him. But here's the deal. They're tripped up. Why? 
because Jesus healed them on the Sabbath. We read this in verse 16, John 9, 16. Therefore, some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. And I think we, on the outside, look at that and we criticize the Pharisees because they missed the miracle because they were stuck in their rules on the Sabbath. But listen, their rules on the Sabbath were how they saw God. God couldn't violate the Sabbath, and so Jesus didn't fit into their box, so we got to throw Jesus out. We often do the same thing. We have our own boxes that God fits into. And when he doesn't fit into those boxes, what do we do? It can't be God. It can't be Jesus. We dismiss it. Often because God didn't do something we thought he should do or he allowed something into our lives we think he shouldn't have allowed, we dismiss him. Maybe for you, it is what God can heal. You believe God can heal a cold, but he certainly can't heal cancer. Or maybe it's God's provision. You feel like it's my job, my duty to work and work and work. And you leave no room to trusting that God has it. He knows how to meet your needs. The challenge for many of us is that God actually wants to bust out of our boxes. But we keep trying to shove them back in. And we re- or we reject him. One of those two. We shove him in the box or we reject him as being, that can't be God. That's what kept the Pharisees from believing Jesus. It's kept his hometown from believing in him. And it's what keeps us from seeing God as he truly is. And so again, my prayer is God bust through our boxes so that we can see you as you truly are. Let me give you the second reason for unbelief that we often fall into. And it is that we believe that God can do miracles over there, but we doubt he will do it for us. You know what's amazing? As you read the Gospels, No one disputes the miracles that Jesus is doing. Never once are the miracles themselves disputed. Why? They couldn't dispute they happened. So they disputed how they happened. And that's what is happening in Jesus' hometown in verse 2. How are these miracles performed by his hand? We don't get it. Listen, they heard the stories of all the work that Jesus was doing. Most of the places Jesus would perform those miracles were less than a journey away from his hometown at this time. And so they knew he did these miracles, but they failed to believe they could be done here, where they were. I think that's the subtle truth for many of us. We believe Jesus can do great miracles somewhere else for others. Down in Ashbury, they can have revival, but I don't know if he'll do it here. Right? Somewhere else. But somehow we fail to believe Jesus can do a miracle right here in my life right now. And it wasn't that these people didn't know or love Jesus. They did. But for some reason, they didn't believe Jesus could or would do the same things for them that he had done over there. I believe... Again, that often describes us. We know Jesus. We love him. We believe he can do great things. Somehow, though, our unbelief is that he can't do it for me or he won't do it for me. But why? Why can't we experience what other people have? Why can't we have a visitation of God right here, right now? Why can't the Holy Spirit come and do a stirring in our midst today, right now? See, God's power was incredible, just readily available in Nazareth just as much as it was in the various cities around him that, at that time. But it was stopped because of what? Unbelief. Why did they choose unbelief? Because they were living by sight, not by faith, which is really the natural way to live, right? When we're in trials and struggles of life, what is it easiest to see? The trial and the struggle, right? That's living by sight. It's interesting that the Bible reverses the order. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, For we live by faith not by sight. 
Everything changes in a Christian's life when they turn their eyes on Jesus instead of what they can only see. And this is exactly actually what Jesus is after. Listen closely, the life of a believer is not less trials and less struggles. I actually believe that my life would be way easier if I didn't serve Jesus at all. I had less, less problems and trials coming in my life. The difference though is this, how a believer goes through those times, it's that that points to the miracle working power of Jesus. But that happens only because our faith is anchored in our God to get us through. That happens because we know and we trust and we have confidence that God is working all things together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. That is a fact. Not what my circumstances say. Whether it feels like it or not, the fact is, is God is working for my good. And by faith, I'm going to stand on that. But I also tell you, you can't fake that. This isn't about just saying the right words and lying to yourself. It happens because you're convinced. You believe and know that God is a God who loves you and cares about you and there's nothing he would allow you to go through that he's not going to bring you through. And so it happens through prayer and time in God's word where our faith is being built up. Philippians 4, 6 through 7 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And look what happens. The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And here's what I've learned. When I am living by sight, not by faith, I'm filled with all kinds of anxiety, all kinds of doubt, and all kinds of frustration. I can actually look at my life and know what I'm focused on just by how much I'm anxious over it, how much I'm doubting that God is in this, or how much I'm frustrated with God. But when I'm living by faith, completely trusting and believing that God can do the impossible, no matter what the circumstances say, God is working something good out of it. Listen, there's a sense of peace that transcends my understanding. You know what that means? It doesn't make sense from the outside. Nothing logical about it, but God, he's given me peace even though nothing has changed. God doesn't just stop at giving us peace. Look what it says. He guards your mind and your heart from all of those things that try to harm you if your faith wasn't anchored in God. I want to close with this. What happens when we come to a spot where we recognize our version of God is too small. And we also recognize I'm plagued, really, with a whole lot of unbelief that I didn't know was in my heart before I walked in here. Listen, in Mark chapter 9, there's another story of a father who comes to Jesus with his boy who is literally trying to be killed by the demon that is living inside of him and it's tormenting him. The disciples, they already tried to cast it out and have failed. And so this father is desperate. He doesn't even know if Jesus can help him. So he comes to him and he says this in verse 22. If you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Again, I think the answer to that is every one of us have been there with God. God, if you can do anything, help me out here. Right? You've prayed that. We're coming to God with our need but there's this question, can you really make a difference? Will this prayer really matter? Can God help or will he help? Jesus' response was this in verse 23, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. And I want you to get this. Look at this really closely. Jesus turns his response back on the man. The issue isn't if Jesus can. The issue is, if you believe Jesus can. And if you can, everything is possible to the person who believes. Again, you can't fake that. But I think it's the response of the Father that teaches us the incredible truth that I'm hoping we will live by this week. 
Look what verse 24 says. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. It is so important for us to cry out to God in that same fashion. God, you know me. I have a certain amount of faith. That's, that's why I'm here. That's why I came to you in the first place. I know that I can't do this. But I also recognize that my faith falls short. And I'm struggling with, and if you can do this in my life right now, you know that. I can't pretend. God, I placed you in a box. But I need you right now to bust through that box and show me that you're bigger than I can imagine right now, whatever I'm facing. See, the life of faith is this. It's simply always placing the trust I have in the hope that God is more than enough. And that's all God's ever after for us to do, to give to him. And so we pray, God, can you make up the difference? Can you break out of my boxes? And when Jesus saw the Father's heart, he responded, and he healed his son, not because the Father had perfect faith, but because he placed all the faith he had in that moment in Jesus. You know, that's what we did at salvation. I guarantee not one of us fully understood what God was doing when he saved us. I still don't understand what he fully did when he saved me and what it cost. But what we did was we took the faith we had that Jesus says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved, and we trusted him. And what did he do? He saved us. And it was the most transforming thing we've ever experienced in our lives. Here's what's sad. That wasn't meant to just be the only time that happens in our lives. We're called to live by faith, not by sight. We're to be living the rest of our lives with that kind of faith, the kind of faith that says, you know what, I'm not going to let circumstances tell me. I don't have to have it all figured out. All I got to know is what God said, and I'm going to trust him that what he said is true. We recognize that when we're struggling, I need to lay this at his feet, knowing God can do the impossible, even beyond whatever I could comprehend or imagine or think he could do, God is able to do it. And so my prayer is that we spend this week recognizing my view of God is too small. And I desperately need him to break through these boxes I have. Because I don't know about you, but I don't want to live by circumstances. I don't want to live in the natural. I serve a supernatural God who supernaturally saved me and filled me with the Spirit. And why do I limit him? Why do I keep him boxed up? And if we start getting a glimpse of what God wants to do in our lives, it's so much bigger than what we've ever experienced before. And every day we wake up and go, okay, what's he going to do today? Yesterday, I only saw him this big, but today this big, and tomorrow it's going to be this big. And then every day he should be getting bigger. And that's our faith growing and trusting in a God who does the supernatural. And and believe me, when that happens, everything changes in our lives. We're not walking defeated. We're not being tripped up left and right. We're walking in victory and in the power of the Spirit because God is a miracle-working God. Would you bow your heads and pray? Jesus, God, my heart is breaking in a way today because I know I know that the pain and the struggles that we go through in this life are real. And I know the stories of so many of my friends here this morning, God, who are they're really facing difficult things. And it's not easy. And Lord, what you're calling them to walk through is not easy. 
But Lord Jesus, I just pray that you would do what only your spirit can do, which is give us the faith to believe. God, that we will not hold on to unbelief or doubt because we know that that ties your hands. God, that some of us would realize that, Lord, what we wanted has died. But God, you're a God who raises the dead. What we think is done is not done. I'm just going to be quiet because I think God is saying he has something specific for you that only his spirit can drop in your spirit. And you have maybe have never experienced this before in your life, but I'm just going to ask you to say just one sentence and listen. It's simply this, speak, Lord, for your child is listening and listen to what God wants to say to you right now. God, I thank you and believe with all my heart that you are able to speak life into our life and into our circumstances like only you can. Lord, we just want to receive all that you have for us. So I pray again today, would you break through our boxes? And help us to experience you more than we ever have before.